Think of all the situations in which your feelings are incredibly dangerous. And one of them is in the situation of really liking someone or loving someone and using that as your justification for continuing to invest and invest and invest and invest to make it work long beyond the point where the evidence suggests that's a good idea for your mental health, for your time, for your energy, for your other relationships which suffer because this is poisoning you and you're miserable and you're giving your worst energy to everyone else in your life who can see that you're breaking down. But your singular mission right now is to get this person to love you back. And I have heard this argument over and over and over again. Someone is going through a breakup and the other person has told them they don't want to make it work. The other person's told them, oh, I just, you know, the classic is, I really love you. You're the love of my life. But if there's a but, why tell me the first sentence? The first sentence is irrelevant if there's a but coming. This is for you. This is so you can feel like the hero on the way out. But when someone is exiting a relationship, when someone is saying they can't be with you, you have to be really honest with yourself and say, okay, they're telling me that they can't be with me because whatever reason, but they're telling me how much they love me and how they truly want to be with me, but they, they, I'm the love of their life. But you have to ask yourself, if I was them and I loved me the way they say they do, what would I be doing right now? What sacrifice would I be willing to make? What compromise would I be willing to make? And if they're not making that, then you have to say, they either don't love me as much as they're saying they do, or we have completely different standards for how much we're willing to fight for each other. Either one is bad. Either one doesn't speak to a situation where you should continue investing. Are they reaching out saying, I made a giant mistake and I'm ready to invest on the level that you want me to? No, I mean, they're saying that they really miss me and that they really love me and that they're really sad. Tell me what information that represents. Tell me what advancement that represents. Tell me what progress that represents. Other than just this phatic speech that's designed to elicit emotion without any form of progress. That is either because they're just deeply sad and they're too selfish to realize in this moment that this is hurting you to reach out this way. And it's only good for them because they can still get their validation or that they want to check that you're still there. I mean, saying, I really miss you. Are you still there? The problem is we get this message from this person and we go, they're still thinking of me. It's like home. It's like home just came back. That's what it feels like. You're out in the wilderness. You're in the abyss again of being single, of the horrible wild west of dating that you didn't want to go back to of wondering when you'll meet someone that you have such a strong connection with again. And then in all of this darkness, home reaches out in the form of this blue light emanating from your phone and a set of letters that happen to form a name that you have been (laughs) conditioned to, to feel something when you see it on a Pavlovian level. You see that name on your phone and you can't help it. You're, it's anchoring at that point. You've, you, your emotions are anchored to that name. Your job first and foremost is to take care of you. That's your number one job in the world is to take care of yourself, to look after yourself. No one, no one is gonna be responsible for that job to nearly the extent that you are in your lifetime. You are the only person who has always been there for you You're the only person who has woken up with you every morning of your life and gone to bed with you every night. On the hardest nights in your life, in the most difficult moments in your life, every time you were in your bedroom crying over something, every time you thought your world was ending, you were the only person that has been there every second Mm -hmm. of every day for your entire life. Your job, not because you're so special, but because it's your job is to look after yourself. And when someone is going Mm -hmm. through a heartbreak and a guy or a woman keeps texting you and you keep responding out of this misguided sense of love, Mm. you are deeply wounding every time the one person you're supposed to show more love to than anybody, the one person 
that you have custody over, that you, your job in your life is to take care of. You're wounding that person over and over again. And people do that in the name of love all the time. They are masochists to themselves and it, it has to stop. And those feelings don't matter. I really believe your feelings about mm. someone, if that person can't deliver, mm -hmm. if they can't give you what you need, if they can't show up for you, your feelings towards them are irrelevant. I think there's a number of things in a relationship that the kind of cornerstones of the demise, okay? Indifference and contempt and neglect and violence are probably the four most important. I'm not talking about big violence. Microaggressions are plenty. Indifference, when you start to feel like the other person fundamentally is not really caring about you anymore or you don't care about them. What they feel, what they think, who they are, what they're about. But it's more than losing of interest. Mm. It's also when you are indifferent, you degrade the other person. They're less important to you. They don't matter. Mm. And ultimately what we feel in relationships is that we matter. That is the essential reason for connecting to people is that we are creatures of meaning. Right. I matter to you. I'm someone. You care about me. You want my, you want my well-being. You're proud of me. You, you want good for me. You're benevolent. All mm -hmm. of that. When you are indifferent, the whole thing goes. And then you start to, there's that coldness that creeps in, that sense of estrangement, that complete disconnect. The second one is neglect. Neglect, when people just basically take each other for granted. You know, I, they take more care of their car than of their partner. Or their dog. Or, or their dog, anybody, yeah, yeah. anything, their yard, anything. Anything gets attendance. Their and business. They, their yeah. business for sure. Their business for sure. You know, everything gets priority. Everything gets reviewed, evaluated, <laughs> attended to. People have this idea that they put it all in when they were dating. And then once they seal the knot, it's like as if they tie the knot, it's like now they don't have to do squat anymore. Mm. And they go into this kind of complete sense of complacency and laziness. It's an amazing thing. They think this thing is just going to live on its own, like a cactus. Violence. Violence. The abuse, the level of, of disrespect. I mean, most people talk nicer to anybody else than their partner when a relationship Why is that? Because you can't get away with it. Because you can't get away with it. Because if you talk like this at work, you're gone. Because if you talk like this with the police, you're gone. Because if you talk like this on the street, you're being punched. But with your partner, you have that sense that they're going to be there anyway. They're just going to take it because it's family. And family is this kind of this thing that doesn't dissolve so easily. So you can just lash out at them and talk to them with a tone mm. and a dismissal. And then contempt, I think, is the top one. Contempt is the killer of them all. There's the degradation of the other. It's, it's that, that complete, dis you're nothing. You're mm. nothing. I can kill you with that one gaze, that one eyebrow that goes up, that, pff, you mm. know, the f uh, do you t who do you think you right. are? What are? And that's it. You, you're done. You're done. Truth is this. There's only two relationships that resemble each other. The one you have with your parents or the people who raise you and the one you have with the people you fall in love with. People can sit in my office all the time and say, I have this with no one else. I don't have this with anybody at work. Nobody among my friends ever thinks like that. You're the only one who speaks like this or thinks this about me or with whom I do this. And now we go back in history. It is the place where we often learned about closeness, trust, loyalty, commitment, sharing, taking, receiving, asking, all these essential verbs of relationships, we learn that at home. We also learn jealousy and all these other things. Possessiveness, vengeance, yes. you name them. The, and we bring that with us and we often promise ourselves, I'll never be this one. I'll never be this way. I'll never talk like this. Please. And then we feel ashamed about it. And since we don't like to feel ashamed about it, we hide it. And one of the way we hide it is we blame the partner. We want one partner today to give us everything that involves stability and security and everything that involves playfulness and mystery. Okay, that's the grand ideal. Okay, I want to be cozy with you and I want to have an edge and I want you to surprise me and I want you to be familiar and I want you to give me continuity and I want you to give me novelty. And no Victoria's Secret is going to solve that. Then it becomes, how, what is desire? Desire is to own the wanting. If you ask people a question that goes like this, I turn myself off when? 
I turn myself off by. Not you turn me off when and what turns me off is. You're going to hear I turn myself off when I do emails, when I spend too much time on the phone, when I overeat, when I don't exercise, when I have bad, bad days at work, when I don't feel confident, when I numb myself, when I feel dead, when I don't feel thriving, when I'm not alive. You will really hear that it has very little to do with sex. And when you ask people, I turn myself on when or by, I, I awaken my desires. Not you turn me on when. What turns me on is, which is, i.e., you're responsible for my right. wanting. Right. What people will talk to you about is when I'm in nature, when I'm connected with my friends, when I get to do my sports, when I play music, when I listen to music. It's stuff that gives me pleasure, that is alive, that is vibrant, that is vital, that is erotic in the full sense of the word as life force. Right. And from that place, people remain interested in having sex with somebody else for the long haul. I feel good about myself. Hmm. The biggest turn on is confidence. Right. Confidence. You ask people, when do you find yourself most drawn to your partner? The, every description has to do with when they're in their element, when they're on stage, when they're, with, when, when, when they're doing their sport, when they, when they are radiant, when they are in their studio, on the piano, on the horse, you name it. It's when they are in their element, i.e. they don't need me to take care of them. They're not needy. They don't need me because desire is about wanting you. Mm. Love is also about needing you. Caretaking is a very powerful experience in love and it is a very powerful anti-aphrodisiac. You know, sticks and stones can break my bones. Words will never hurt me. I'm thinking words are what's hurting people more than the sticks and stones. I think some people feel like beat me with a stick, but please stop. Stop criticizing me. Stop undermining me. Stop invalidating me. I can handle that other piece. And obviously we don't want either, but we underestimate the harm words can do. And what ends up happening is when a person is getting chronically, emotionally, and verbally abused, or like I said, gaslighted, invalidated in a relationship, a lot of times they don't get empathy or support from other people. They say, oh, come on, it's not like they're beating you up. Oh, come on, it's not like they're, you know, doing this, like something physical. And I'm thinking, this is the stuff that breaks a psyche. And because you can't, a, a broken psyche doesn't look like a bruise or a black eye, but rather it's a far deeper wound, it gets missed. So yeah, you better believe words hurt you.
fact, that's how people get injured as children. That's how people get injured in the workplace, certainly in their intimate relationships, in their family relationships. 90% of the time, it's words. The challenge here becomes is that it's almost like we have to start at a foundational level, right? People have to respect and believe in their own reality and respect and believe in themselves because otherwise you're vulnerable to someone's words, right? When they're going at you, they're telling you you're incompetent. You don't know what you're talking about. That never happened. You know, who do you think you are? And all this other stuff that leaves a person feeling like they're not enough or that maybe that other person is right, not them. So all of that is foundational work that most people never do. Then you're in this relationship where somebody is speaking to you in these sort of dismissive, gaslighty, manipulative sorts of ways. There's a moment, and this is the challenge, is that for months, if not years, people believe what that person is saying to them. They actually believe that they're all those bad things or they're not enough or they're asking too much or whatever it is, whatever their, their partner's going after them for. But there is a moment when it's a penny drop moment. Maybe it's a, someone's gaslighted you. They've completely denied your reality. And on a strange day, you actually record it and you play it back. You're like, no, I did hear it right. And then over time, you start saying, my reality is actually right. And one of the things I say, I give all, I, get, I use this a lot in my teaching about narcissism. I call it the DEEP technique. And DEEP stands for don't defend, don't engage, don't explain, and don't personalize. And if you can hold on to those four rules, which are not simple rules, they're hard rules, but don't defend, don't engage, don't explain, don't personalize. Don't defend is when somebody is saying you did something and you didn't do it don't defend it. There's no point, you know, because now what happens is you start going down the rabbit hole and the don't engage part really means that you pull back quite a bit. You recognize that I'm always walking on eggshells. No matter how I say this, I get it wrong. And the don't personalize pieces, this is them. It's not you. And especially the don't personalize piece, that's hard for people to think it's got to be me. And I'm like, no, it's not you. If anything, you're so empathic that you're easy to take advantage of because they know you're going to keep coming back. So having those four simple rules, and those would apply to any kind of relationship. I also tell people it's incredibly important to have other voices in your life, other supports, whether that's friends, colleagues, family members, whoever your people are. What you start seeing is that all these other people are saying, I'm solid, I'm good, I'm kind, I'm competent. One person only is saying these things, you know, and w which side you're going to go on. And what makes it harder is if people heard these negating messages in childhood. So because then the narcissistic partner comes along and they're basically reinforcing these messages of I'm not enough from childhood. That cycle of defending and rationalizing someone who's saying you're not enough, something we call trauma bonding. You actually justify the narcissistic person and that's a cycle that started in childhood the child doesn't have an option the parent they got the parent they got so they will justify that mating grapples with the dilemmas of desire on the inside of relationships and rethinking infidelity looks at what happens when desire breaks free and in a way it goes looking elsewhere so it is a natural continuation but the logical thing is to say people do this because they have problems in the relationship. It's the symptom model. An affair happens because there's a flawed relationship. Rather than actually grappling with much more complicated imponderables of existential ennui and complexities of love and desire by which actually affairs happen and sometimes they have nothing to do with the relationship. The relationship is actually perfectly fine. That's not what it's about. And then you enter into the question of transgression. After all, infidelity has existed since marriage was invented. So marriage has changed continuously and infidelity has a, tenacious, a tenaciousness that marriage can only envy. <laughs>
you know, and so that's a, a line that has become very, very clear that there's a robustness to infidelity. No single model of infidelity of marriage manages to outdo. It's like a race. No matter how much marriage tries to adapt to the times, infidelity tops it. There's always another way. So now we need to look at the power of transgression. What is it about us from Adam and Eve on that wants to break free out of the very constraints which we have sometimes created, which yesterday we thought were the ones we wanted? I wanted nothing more than this family and these children and this secure job and this big home I have and all of that. And then one day, all of that feels so meaningless. It's been, it's been the shackles. It's been the thing I wanted to break. I have done always what was expected of me. And now I want to do what I really want to do. And that narrative goes back to what I talked about when I spoke about what people regret when they die. You know, it's, you hear the conversation between the dutiful self and the selfish self between the thinking about others and the thinking about me, and the places where they go together and the places where they clash. And so here is this thing called infidelity, which by definition is an act of entitlement and selfishness. But it has a lot more to do with what I do for me than what I'm actually doing to you. And yet, when it is uncovered, what it does to you is so shattering and so gutting so painful, more so than it ever was. I am fascinated by how we one day want certain things and how the next day, those are the things that we think are imprisoning us. How we can have multiple loves, how we can have different kinds of loves, how we became one person. Step one, wake up, brother, go rise with the sun. Step two, Get some good, some food in you. Step three, you grow hard about what you wanna be. Step four, everybody just do your thing. Wake up, today's gonna be a good day. 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 Wake up. Today's gonna be a good day Yo, Set your affirmations, aspirations I got shit to do, the aftermath of preparation Good food, good mood, blood in circulation One step at a time, yeah that's how you make it Set a goal you control and the steps you take them I try to pick one thought, have some concentration And if I make a mistake, it's called education I try to do this every day, call it replication Wake up, today's gonna be a good day Wake up Today's gonna be a good day. Wake up. 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 Today's gonna be a good day. Life ain't easy, yo. I think there's a reason, though. Ups and downs, just like every different season, yo Sometimes I'm high, other times I'm barely breathing, though I always gotta fight and hide from the demons, yo Negative thoughts are poison, they ride, uh. Head full of flaws, so here come the clouds, uh. They'll never stop unless I can swap All the bad for the good in my head when I'm lost, uh. Yeah, so I'ma fake it till I make it Positive thoughts are overtaken, I got patience One day at a time is how you operate a cadence A flow, you grow, you show yourself a foundation Stay away from all the shit that causes temptation I know that I like to do it cause of sensation I live my life in my head like a narration Don't expect greatness, do my best, man, I'll take it Wake up, today's gonna be a good day Wake up Today's gonna be a good day. Wake up. 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 Today's gonna be a good day.
fear. And then we remember that there are all these other parts of us and they suddenly manifest elsewhere. How sexual revolutions don't happen at home and how the same person who here is completely sexually shut down in this other place is lustful and free and eager and why they can't bring it home. And all these imperfections, and in some level you would say that infidelity is an imperfect compromise to imperfect lives. We've always had rules and we've always wanted to break rules. The rules change. And, you know, let's be very clear, fidelity was an imposition on women in order to know about patrimony and lineage. Now that you can't prove it by the children, you prove it by the exclusiveness. But it's changed from an imposition on women to a dual gender conviction. Instead of giving more freedom to women, we've taken the freedoms of men away. I wanted a conversation that will embrace complexity, as always. I think I deal with subjects that are complicated and that people often want to simplify to, the, to make them reductionistic and simplistic and are often very polarized. So the conversation about infidelity becomes a conversation about villain and victim and good and bad and perpetrator and saint. And I think it is not the truth. And I don't believe that these kinds of conversations that are polarized, that are extreme, in which you take the extreme example and you make that become the norm. And they breed narrowness, judgmentalness and discrimination. And they don't help couples and families and children, that's for sure.